Case Western Reserve University's Institute for the Science of Origins proudly presents the Origin Science Scholars Program. The Institute advances the scientific understanding and application of the origins and evolution of human and natural systems. The Origin Science Scholars Lectures are presented with the assistance of Case Western Reserve University's Siegel Lifelong Learning Program, College of Arts and Sciences, and Media Vision. Tonight's lecture is presented in, in collaboration with CWRU's Department of History. It forms the first of a three-part series on the COVID pandemic and mental health, all co-sponsored with the Department of History. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Avez Aftab, clinical professor, clinical assistant professor in the Department of Psychology of Case Western Reserve University's School of Medicine. Dr. Aftab describes himself as a psychiatrist with philosophical interests and is very active not only in the academic sphere, but in the public sphere as well. Tonight, Dr. Aftab will talk with us about COVID-19 and depression. When does depression become a disorder? Please join me in welcoming Dr. Aftab. Thank you so much. Uh, good, good evening, everyone. Um, very honored and pleased to be part of speaking, uh, speaking as part of the series. Um, so as Patricia mentioned, I am um, clinical assistant professor of psychiatry at Case Western. I also do a lot of clinical work at the state psychiatric hospital. Uh, a lot of my academic work focuses on conceptual and philosophical aspects of psychiatry. And in this talk today, as we'll be talking about depression and COVID-19, um, I have attempted to bring some of that conceptual clarity to the subject matter as well, while at the same time make, keeping it accessible uh, to, to a general um, audience. So, um, so this is sort of like the, the outline for, uh, for the talk today would be sort of like in three parts, as we were discussed, about 15 minutes each. And before we go to COVID-19 and depression in the context of that, we'll have to tackle the question of like, what is depression and, and how should we best understand it as a diagnosis? And then we also have to touch base, sort of like discuss what leads to depression, uh, how do we understand the relevant risk factors, mechanisms, its, its causes, what do we know about that? And based on that, then we can begin to apply uh, that understanding uh, to depression in the context of COVID-19 and tease out some of the ways, sort of like, you know, the question is answered and the question is unanswered. So, uh, so that's kind of like, you know, to give you a broad overview of what we'll be talking about. Okay. So part one, uh, what we talk about when we talk about depression. Um, the first thing we have to recognize is that the term depression itself is, is sort of like very am ambiguous, imprecise. It has multiple meanings. It's used in different ways in different contexts. And this is particularly confusing because uh, depression uh, as a term has, has entered our everyday conversations uh, and sort of like it's used by individuals to refer to this sort of like feeling of sadness, this feeling of being down or stressed. And, um, and that makes it difficult to distinguish between these ordinary states of unhappiness and these ordinary states of, of misery with, uh, with the forms of depression that we, we might see in, in the clinic, whether it's a psychiatric clinic or otherwise, and the forms of depression that we uh, end up treating in, in some form or another. Um, even within clinical context, the, the, the term does not have a uniform usage. Um, it, sometimes it's, refer, uh, it's used to refer just to a symptom. So the symptom of low mood or the symptom of loss of interest in pleasurable activities or inability to experience pleasure, but it's also called anhedonia. So it can refer to these symptoms alone. But at other times when the term depression is used, it is being used to refer to a particular uh, disorder the pro prototypical depressive disorder, what we also call major depressive disorder. And at other times when we use the term depression, we use it to refer to many depressive disorders, basically uh, sort of like a group of disorders that share low mood and loss of interest as, as the characteristic symptom. Um, this can include dysthymia, persistent depressive disorder, uh, premenstrual uh, sort of like depressive or dysphoric disorder, et cetera. So, so it's important to be uh, precise or important to have some idea of how the term is being used 
Uh, most of the time when I'm using uh, this, this term today, I'm referring to major depressive disorder, but sometimes sort of like uh, this term is used with, refer with reference to symptoms as well, or sort of like overall the symptoms of major depression. Um, to, for people who are unfamiliar uh, with uh, with this diagnosis itself, or uh, or with the with psychiatry's diagnostic manual, the DSM, um, this is how the DSM defines uh, major depressive disorder, um, and these are the criteria, official criteria listed. Um, the first criteria is that we need five or more symptoms, and then I'll show you the list of symptoms on on the next slide. So out of those, we need at least five. And uh, out of those five, one needs to be either low mood or loss of interest, which is also called anhedonia. And then these symptoms need to be present for a two week period um, such that during those two weeks, these symptoms have been present for most of the time or for the majority of the duration. And they need to be severe enough that they cause distress or impairment in, in functioning. And they're not better explained by another medical or psychiatric condition. And, and this, this slide shows you what the nine symptoms are. And um, at, at, I mean, I've underlined the first two as indicated, either one of them is necessary. Um, we can have, uh, in addition to that, change in appetite could be sort of like, you know, low or could be up, some sort of a sleep disturbance, uh, psychomotor agitation or retardation, basically slowing down of, of, of physical movements, uh, fatigue, uh, feelings of worthlessness, poor concentration, and then thoughts of death or, or, or suicidal ideation. Now, if you, if you take a little moment to, th to think about this particular list um, and, and the, the other criterion that surround it, basically the, the two week time period and that you need five uh, out of these nine symptoms, uh, some really some interesting questions emerge. And such as like, why these nine symptoms and, and not other symptoms? And, and if you look at the literature itself and if you look at the history of depression, um, a long list of things have been described as symptoms and as features of depression. Um, even if we just look at the rating scales themselves for, for depression, we have 50 different symptoms that have been described. And, and uh, if you look at some other sources, you can find even more than 100 symptoms. So why these particular nine and, and not, not others? And then if we, even if we restrict ourselves to just these nine symptoms, why five out of nine? Like, why not four or what, why not six? You know, why, why that specific threshold? And then when we look at the time criteria and sort of like, you know, then like why for a two week period, you know, why not say one week or why not say four weeks or, or, or a month? And, um, and the sort of like the unfortunate answer is that a lot of these thresholds are, are based on historical consensus that at some point in the 70s and 80s, clinicians decided that these sorts of thresholds made the most sense so it was sort of like a commonsensical judgment. It was not based on any sort of systematic uh, research or systematic view of literature, but it was a sort of like uh, a clinical intuition that this seemed to make sense, uh, which means that there's room for a lot of disagreement, which means that this, this notion, this sort of like this category of depression could reasonably be, be categorized and classified in, in, in many different ways. So if, if we look at this sort of like, you know, what is going on when we talk about um, major depressive disorder per se, on, on one side, we have this operational construct. Uh, that is, we, we recognize that people get depressed. We recognize that people sort of like have these extreme states of, of suffering that, that require some form of help. It's an abstract, fuzzy kind of concept. So we try to make it measurable. And as part of making it measurable, we come up with different sorts of thresholds. We come up with sort of like different forms of uh, different measurable criteria as a way of making something fuzzy like that a little bit more tractable. And as part of doing that, we want sort of like set a threshold and we've seen what that is, but we also distinguish sort of like it from other disorders. So, you know, distinguishing depression from anxiety or distinguishing the depression from let's say manic depression or bipolar disorder. And how we do that is subject to a little bit of debate as well. The other part is that not only we are um, sort of like, you know, identifying some sort of like a construct or some sort of a syndrome, in, we're making an additional judgment in that we are calling it a disorder. And what, what, what we sort of like mean by that is also quite unclear. Uh, if, if we look at the uh, sort of like the, 
the sort of judgments that, that are involved. And, and this is something that we'll, we'll talk in a little bit more detail in later in the presentation as well. But the no, there's this idea of dysfunction, which refers to this sort of folk psychological judgment that something has gone wrong in, in some sense. It's, it's not been very precise. It's, the term itself is not defined in the diagnostic manual itself, but there is, it refers to this general idea that something has gone wrong in some sense. So it's obviously very value laden and social cultural inference. And then sort of like there's this idea that it is distressing enough and is it disabling enough that, that, that it requires some form of help. So that's what sort of like what this term, this judgment calling something a disorder is intended to imply, which raises a lot more questions uh, than, than it answers. So in order to make things a little bit more clear, let, let's, let's look at an analogy with, uh, with two medical conditions, you know, which, which will help us answer uh, or at least understand how should we understand this thing called depression. So first is acute appendicitis. You know, this is a situation, for example, the classic symptoms is that we have a uh, right lower quadrant abdominal pain, so typically very severe. Along with that, you have nausea, vomiting, and then you can have elevated white cell count. Now, this is the classic syndrome of, of acute appendicitis. And if we wanted to determine the validity of this, what certainly there are several ways we can do that. We can sort of like, let's say, surgically open up the abdomen and look at the appendix and we can see whether the appendix is inflamed or not. And if the appendix is inflamed, it's, it's acute appendicitis. And if it's not, infl not inflamed, it's not. So we have something external to these, to these symptoms that we can appeal to, that we can sort of like look at and we can use it for the purposes of categorization. Versus consider something like essential hypertension. Which, uh, we, uh, which is generally defined as uh, systolic and diastolic blood pressure greater than 140 by 90 on two or more occasions. And so in this case, how do we determine the validity of this, this syndrome? Because unlike appendicitis, where we have something external to refer to, something in addition to the symptoms, in the case of blood pressure, we basically just have the distribution of blood pressure itself. And at a certain point, at a certain demarcation, we say that beyond this point, we're going to call it um, uh, uh, sort of like essential hypertension, which raises a similar source of threshold problems as for depression is that sort of like, you know, if we're calling it 140, then why not 150 or why not 130? So it, it raises similar sorts of consideration. Uh, in the case of hypertension, we have somewhat of a clear idea regarding what we want the, this threshold to do. And what we wanted to do is that prevent future complications, such as you know, lower, a lower risk of stroke or a lower risk of cardiovascular complications. And based on that data, we can adjust the threshold. Unfortunately, in the case of depression, um, the threshold has not been tied to any sort of uh, sort of like firm or concrete outcome uh, as for example in, in the case of hypertension it's been sort of like it's relatively more arbitrary it doesn't mean it's uh, it's sort of like you know meaningless or doesn't it mean it has value it doesn't have value but it is subject to more arbitrariness so depression is much more like hypertension than something like appendicitis uh, in, you know if de if depression were like appendicitis we would expect that, that we would see this sort of two separate sorts of clusters, that we would see this separate cluster of ordinary unhappiness, and we would see a separate cluster of clinical depression when we, when we look at the depression symptoms and, and, the, and the severity. This is what we would expect if it was like an acute appendicitis. But in fact, this is the sort of thing that we see. So this is, this is a figure that, that depicts uh, responses from an online survey of depressed individuals. And you can see that there's no, it's, it's basically uh, you're, you're getting a sort of normal distribution. Um, there's no clear demarcating line between where normal or ordinary unhappiness or ordinary stress should end and where clinical depression begins. So we are kind of like, you know, like blood pressure, we're sort of like forced to draw a threshold, uh, you know, based on what we want that threshold to do. Uh, this is a figure from another uh, from another study, meta-analysis of studies. But again, if you look at the distribution of how symptoms are are distributed, we can see that there's no natural cutoff point. There, you know, any any demarcating line that we use will have a certain degree of arbitrariness. And similarly, I mentioned that you know we have a threshold problem not only with respect to to sort of like you know where the boundary between ordinary unhappiness and clinical depression is going to be. We have a boundary problem when it comes to depression and other disorders as well. 
So this lists some of the related disorders that, that we see in the diagnostic manual. So anxiety and depression often co-occur. Uh, a lot of people who are depressed are also anxious. A lot of people who are anxious are also depressed. So where does this sort of like, you know, are we, is this, are we dealing with sort of like one thing that manifests in two different ways? Or is it sort of like two separate things that just happen to uh, coexist a lot of the times? What about adjustment disorder, which is sort of like, you know, considered as a separate diagnostic entity, but refers to a situation where individuals are having difficulty adjusting to life circumstances, let's say a change in job or, or divorce or something like that, that is not severe enough that it merits, um, that it meets criteria for major depression. Or for example, post-traumatic stress disorder, a lot of time when people experience significant uh, traumatic events, they do experience depressed mood as part of that. Where does sort of like, that sort of like diagnostic entity and, and where does depression as a separate diagnostic entity begin? So what we sort of like see is that depression is not only on a continuum with ordinary un, sort of like unhappiness, it is also on a continuum with other disorders, with other symptom clusters, other syndromes, and how to draw that boundary is, is not really clear. And, and sort of like, you know, sometimes it's expressed as a way that the space of psychopathology, basically the space of psychiatric symptoms, it can be carved up in, in many different ways. Uh, you know, just as, for example, we may organize books in a library in many different ways, or, or we may uh, carve up a turkey in many different ways. There is no, at the moment, as far as we know, there is no single privileged, objectively correct way to do that. You know, we are doing it in certain ways based on consensus, based on historical considerations, but we could just as well carve up and we could just as well classify these symptoms, this, the, these syndromes in other ways if, if, if we wanted to. And so this sort of like brings up a lot of like pragmatic considerations regarding what it is that we want our classifications to do. What is it that we want our sort of like uh, thresholds and we want our demarcations between different syndromes to do. And we can think about different things. We, we may be interested in treatment response. We, we may want our threshold to discriminate between who responds to a certain medication. We may be interested in genetic research. You know, we may be interested in having our thresholds demarcate individuals with different genetic profiles. Or let's say we may be interested in a longitudinal course. How do sort of like these conditions um, sort of like develop and involve as, as time sort of like, you know, uh, goes, goes on. And so there are many different ways we can do that. And right now there's no clear instance in which sort of like, you know, there's, there, there's no clear way in which our diagnostic criteria and thresholds are uh, optimizing any one of the things. It is trying to optimize everything at the same time, resulting in a sort of unsatisfactory solution. So this, uh, um, here we see the, the sort of like summary of the part one, uh, depression is an imprecise term. Uh, it appears to be dimensional. It exists on a continuum like blood pressure IQ uh, with no natural cutoff points. Where to draw the boundaries, a complex practical judgment. Um, and just that depression exists on a continuum with ordinary unhappiness. It exists on a continuum with other disorders. And uh, um, the science of psychiatric classification is still immature in, 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 in many ways. We have a question here from Dominic. Uh, who says, uh, when thinking about treating certain disorders like these, uh, will medication or treatment options be adjusted based on the results of research that you're doing? Uh, you know, the, 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 the sort of research that's done on psychiatry, is it similar to the sort of thing that, that you might do for hypertension or something like that? I really hope, uh, and that's what we would like. Uh, unfortunately, this hasn't happened because um, it, it has not been, uh, it, it, it has been difficult to demonstrate the relationship between uh, response to certain interventions such as medications and certain thresholds. We begin to talk about uh, some of the risk factors of depression and some of the sort of like emerging understanding of the, of the mechanisms um, in, in, involved in, in, in depression um, as, a, as a clinical disorder. So one thing I had at the beginning that, that I want to clarify is this, I, this, this notion of, of depression as, as a chemical imbalance. Now, th this idea has kind of permeated our, our, our popular vocabulary, our folk understanding. It has become very commonplace to sort of like refer to depression as well as other psychiatric disorders as being caused by a chemical imbalance and, and sort of like this idea that um, that treatments such as antidepressants and psychotherapy correct that, that chemical in, in, imbalance. And um, 
and this is this has a complicated history. It uh, but it was really promoted in in the '90s as a sort of simplistic version of more complicated scientific findings by the pharmaceutical company, uh, primarily in, in direct to consumer advertising, and sort of like you know it it sort of like receives support from somewhat from the medical community as well, and then it got rapidly picked up by by the general media and got amplified to a point where it became this this urban legend. Um, there was a hypothesis um, in, in the 60s and 70s that depression might be caused by a deficiency of neurotransmitters such as serotonin or, or norepinephrine. And so it was linked to this idea that there's a deficiency of serotonin, monoamines basically, and that um, these medications correct that deficiency and by restoring them to normal levels. But research in the 70s, 80s, and, and 90s pretty conclusively proved that there was no simple deficiency itself. Uh, People who are depressed, by and large, have the same levels of neurotransmitters, have the same levels of serotonin and norepinephrine as, as other individuals. So this idea of serotonin deficiency is actually a, a sort of scientific myth. It, it has never been demonstrated. But at the same time, it's clear that the monoaminergic pathways are involved in the regulation of mood in some complicated manner. And many of the existing treatments that we have do influence these, these targets, uh, do these pathways in some complicated way. So even though there's a complex relationship, there is no simple chemical in, in, imbalance and, and the community has really moved away from, from that sort of description. <clears throat> the, the general sort of like consensus is that, that a causation in depression is very uh, heterogeneous or sort of like, you know, different people have different sorts of profiles of like what leads them to become depressed. And it's also very multifactorial is you have more than one cause, which are often sort of like simultaneously present, which are interacting. And, and this list of causes is actually quite broad. And it, it ranges from various sorts of biological factors, such as genetic history, monomenergic pathways, neuroplasticity, um, different sorts of brain circuits have been, have been implicated. Uh, HPA access, which is involved in stress response ha has been implicated. Uh, there are there's emerging literature on, on the role of inflammation. So we have sort of like wide variety of these sorts of risk factors and mechanisms that play some kind of a complicated role that plays, that increase the risk of an individual experiencing depression or increase the risk of, of an individual remaining de depressed. We also have various psychological factors that have been described, different sorts of personality traits, uh, in particular neuroticism, um, you know, predisposes, <clears throat> To, to depression, um, certain sorts of thinking patterns, um, which have been identified, for example, in the context of cognitive behavioral therapy, they, they predispose to, to depression. Um, meaning and purpose ha has, has emerged as an important factor. People who feel that they don't, they, they, they sort of like, you know, feel they lack a purpose in life. They have a general sort of like sense of meaninglessness. They are much more predisposed. Um, people who are lonely, Individuals who have adverse life experiences, and many in, in many occasions, the um, depressive episodes are precipitated by some form of an adverse life experience. So there's a strong link there. And then generally, we have, we have understood that at the at the societal level, at, at the social level, um, rates of depression are sort of like correlated with the various sorts of social determinants of health, sort of like things like poverty, things like homelessness things like racial discrimination um, or sort of like, you know, discrimination against women, discrimination against LGBTQ individuals. So, to, so at the social level, depression seems to act as a, 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 as a sort of like barometer of what is going on in the society and, and how oppressed and how sort of like difficult that, that society is for individuals to live in. So, so given that these uh, risk factors and sort of like these ca causal factors are sort of like, you know, sort of like span this entire range, we often sort of like in psychiatry use this term biopsychosocial as a way of like, it, it's a nod towards this complexity. It's a, it's a nod towards this recognition that these risk factors, these causes exist at multiple levels and that they, are in, they, they interact with each other and they are integrated in some complex way. So uh, it, it's not a formal scientific model itself, but it's basically more of a nod towards acknowledging this multi-level uh, complexity. <clears throat> now, another idea I want to introduce um, in this section is the idea of depression as a complex dynamic 
self-sustaining symptom network. And I'm going to walk you through it. And I'll, I'll sort of like explain what that means. And, and, and the reason I'm going to focus on that, it is because it's also one of the few ways, one of the few models of depression, which offers us some clues in distinguishing between these sort of like ordinary states of stress with uh, more clinical states of, of depression or our sort of like disordered state of depression. <clears throat> so first is the idea of the symptom network. And, and this is referring to this, this hypothesis, this sort of like, you know, observation in some way. Um, that the various symptoms of depression, uh, they're not independent of each other, but they directly interact with each other in such a way that they form a network, in, in such a way that you can model them as a network, as nodes, and which are connected by a sort of like, you know, connected by lines. So you can just like, you know, you can model them mathematically, you can model them sort of like graphically like that. So for example, you know, talking about symptoms, so insomnia, for example, we can under, we can see a link between insomnia and fatigue. If someone is experiencing sleep disruption, they're going to be tired. They're going to experience low energy as a direct consequence of that. And if someone is fatigued, that fatigue can directly be linked by, to poor concentration, which is another symptom of depression. And that poor concentration can directly bring the mood down. It can cause low mood. And then that low mood can worsen, for example, insomnia again and various other symptoms. And, you know, since we have, you know, uh, many different symptoms of, of depression, this, uh, this network this can, can be mapped in many different ways and many different sorts of connections uh, can be made. This figure just sort of like, you know, uh, represents the sort of like this idea of symptom networks that we have four different symptoms and they are all uh, interacting with each other in complex ways. And they exist in an external field where they are being modified by, let's say, stressors of various sorts. Let's say someone is medically ill or they, they sort of like they have high levels of inflammation or let's say they are experiencing um, sort of like stressors such as loss of job or a stressful environment for whatever reason. Um, another thing that sort of like helps us recognize is that um, different symptom clusters um, or can also be in connected to each other by means of bridge symptoms. So you have sort of like here a symptom network A and you have a symptom network B and uh, both of them share connections with each other in the form of these symptoms here. And, uh, and sort of like, you know, we can use this as an example, for example, of depression and anxiety. If we can sort of like, you know, think of them as two separate symptom networks, which have some overlapping symptoms, which would also explain why they co-occur so, so sort of like so frequently. Because if we have activation in one network, due to these bridge symptoms, it's going to cause activation in, in, the, set, in the sort of like, you know, sort of like uh, network next to it. And if you have activation in this one, that activation can spread to this one due to these uh, bridge symptoms. And this also explains why uh, sort of like carving a boundary between them or setting a threshold between them is so sort of like difficult in terms of diagnostic criteria, because there is no natural boundary to be found. They're essentially two symptom clusters that are overlapping, interconnected. And it's, it's not as if there's a natural division that we can discover. We can sort of like, you know, carve out sort of like this domain of symptoms in, 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 in different ways. Um, so it also sheds light on the, on the problem of classification and what I expressed about sort of like, you know, these uh, symptoms being classifiable in many different ways. An important idea the symptom network in introduces is that of um, symptom network becoming self-sustaining. So, so, so let's see what that means. <clears throat> so the phase one here is that um, the, the symptom network is in a dominant state. So no, there are no active symptoms are being experienced. There's no stressor. And then you experience some kind of a stressor. Let's say someone experiences divorce or, or they're having marital problems. And that begins to, let's say, disturb their sleep. They begin to have insomnia. They, be, they begin to have irritability. And that generates other symptoms, that activates other symptoms in the network. And then even when the, the stressor goes away, uh, sort of like, you know, the prob whatever problem they were experiencing, the problem has resolved, it's gone away. Uh, but the symptom network, once activated, it has acquired an independence of its own. It has become self-sustaining. It is mutually reinforcing because these symptoms directly influence each other, they directly cause each other. So uh, once the, the entire network is activated, 
it doesn't it is it doesn't need that stressor it doesn't need that uh, external uh, influence anymore it can go on uh, even even when the problem uh, is resolved so from a symptom network standpoint symptoms become disorders when they become self sustaining that is when they acquire a sort of independence from external stressors such that even even if the external stressors are resolved uh, those symptoms are going to continue on and requiring requiring some form of intervention um, <clears throat> um, this also uh, sort of like introduces the idea of resilient networks and vulnerable networks. So uh, a network sort of like can be resilient if, in, uh, if a stressor is experienced and some symptoms are activated, but once that stressor goes away, once that stressor is resolved, um, those symptoms don't activate the entire network. They, they remain localized. And then when the stressor goes away, the symptoms disappear as well. So, so that this is a sort this is a sort of network, and this this depends on the sorts of connections the symptom have with each, with each other, the sorts of configurations they have, and the different factors that influence those those connections. Um, so, but that's sort of like what 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 a resilient network would look like, versus a more vulnerable network would be a situation where uh, some kind of a stressor is experienced. Symptoms get activated. Those symptoms then rapidly activate other symptoms in the network, and leading to uh, sort of like a, uh, really them becoming self-sustained and mutually reinforcing, such that even in the absence of the stressor, they they will continue on, and the person would let's say remain depressed or, or, or remain uh, anxious. So um, we can think of this as this sort of like uh, two by two table where the network can uh, sort of like can be resilient or vulnerable and the stressors can be minimal, can be weak or can be strong. You know, if there, um, if, if there are no stressors being experienced, then and the and the network is resilient, let's say the connections are weak, then this is the state of mental health with, with high resilience. If the network is vulnerable, that is the, 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 the connections between the symptoms are quite strong, then uh, even though at the moment, uh, like no, no severe symptoms are being experienced, there's vulnerability. This person, this individual is going to be vulnerable to uh, developing uh, some kind of psychiatric problem once they are in a stressful situation, once they're in a situation where uh, that could precipitate um, their, their symptoms. In the situation where an individual is in, in a very stressful environment, they're experiencing all sorts of stressor. Then we have these two options. In, in cases where the network is resilient, we are going to have elevated symptoms, but these are symptoms that have not yet become self-sustaining, which means that if we provide the right sort of support to them, if, we, if the stressor resolves or is other ways, or if, like, if they have the sort of necessary help, then these symptoms would go away, they would resolve. Versus the other situation is that if the network is vulnerable and they experience uh, some kind of a stressor, then those, those symptoms would be experienced and those symptoms would become uh, self-sustained and mutually reinforcing such that even when the stress is resolved, the, the, the sort of like that state is going to persist on and would require some kind of intervention in, on it or some kind of treatment um, for, for, that, for that to be addressed. So we have seen that unlike traditional diagnostic criteria, uh, this way of thinking about uh, depression in terms of symptom vectors provides us clues that we can use to think of like, you know, what may differentiate merely having symptoms from, from having symptoms that have become abnormal or, or become disordered in, in, in some way. So to summarize part two, um, depression is complex, multifactorial, or sort of like the buzzword is biopsychosocial. Um, unlike popular understanding, there is no simple chemical imbalance and, and antidepressants don't correct any, any simple serotonin deficiency or any simple chemical imbalance that, that we know. Um, understanding depression requires multiple perspectives, um, range, ranging from a sort of like you know understanding their life story to understanding their personality traits to understanding their biological risk factors, and understanding depression as a dynamic, self-sustaining symptom network offers us additional insights regarding uh, how to differentiate normal from abnormal, and also how to under understand the mechanisms uh, that 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 are involved in symptoms mutually reinforcing each other. So uh, I, I think at this point we can stop and uh, sort of like wrap up the second part.
of the of the talk and uh, see if there are any questions for us. Great. Well, um, let me uh, have, go back to a question from the first part, and that may uh, uh, have been illuminated here. Uh, it is the science of psychiatry just immature, or is it fundamentally limited by the differences uh, compared to other medical models? Yeah, so that's, a, that's it's an interesting uh, philosophical debate, and I, I think you know people have argued both ways. Um, there may be fundamental limits because um, when it comes to psychiatry, we are we're we're dealing with different sort of entities than we are dealing with, let's say, you know, in in pathology, and you know we're dealing with sort of like um, uh, constructs uh, that are psychosocial in nature that are influenced by values, and uh, <clears throat> not only are they value laden. But there are these looping processes where our very act of classification changes sort of like how people behave. Sort of like, you know, once you label someone as being, let's say, depressed or anxious, that influences sort of like what they expect and how, and how they behave. So pe some people have argued that because of this, the process of social construction and because of the value-laden nature of these, there are funda fundamental limits to what we can do. But at the same time, we can argue that um, whatever those limits are, we haven't really done this, the, the scientific work that's, that needs to be done to investigate these questions. So, so for example, like, you know, something as simple as the threshold for depression has not been subjected to the sort of systematic research that we would expect uh, sort of like for, for, that to, for that to happen. We have kind of like, you know, accepted this sort of clinical consensus-based thing for several decades without investigating, you know, systematically what research would suggest. Now, there are some people are beginning to do that, but we haven't sort of like yet done that in a way that uh, would be adequate or we haven't exhausted the scientific means available to us. So, uh, so I, think, I think there's definitely, there are some fundamental limits, but I would say that we are nowhere near close to what those limits might be. Simrita asks, do you think that there is opportunity for preventative treatments for depression for people who show risk factors to reduce or even eliminate the amount of clinical depression one faces? Um, yeah, certainly. I think this is something that will come up briefly in, in part three as well. But, uh, but sort, of like, um, sort of like there are sort of like various ways in which we can sort of like offer preventative opportunities. And in particular, I think, you know, when, it, when we think about stressful situations, we have to think about ways in which we can support that individual. And, and sort of like we can think about so, social structures and societies that provide th that, sort of, uh, that sort of support or, or not. Um, when it comes to um, sort of like things like psychological factors, things like meaning, meaning in life, things like resilience, things like purpose, we can think of settings and situations that promote that sort of thing. We can think of situations that um, promote a sense, a sense of meaning, meaning, meaningfulness in, in life. We can think of like jobs and other sort of like social relationships that provide that sort of thing versus kind of like hyper-capitalistic sort of societies that, that don't necessarily provide those sorts of things. So, so I think there are a lot of opportunities for preventative treatments, um, you know, when it comes to stressful situations, when it comes to various sorts of risk factors that, that we currently aren't really addressing in, in a meaningful way. So uh, related to this, and then we'll have to go back. Uh, Chris asks, uh, how does therapy affect uh, resilient and vulnerable networks? Uh, so, um, you know, again, sort of like, you know, this, uh, this hasn't really been demonstrated in sort of like empirical studies yet, but the, the general idea, the hypothesis would be that, that individuals who successfully undergo uh, uh, psychotherapy uh, develop more resilient networks and that um, sort of like, you know, individuals who haven't had that sort of experience, you know, necessarily might have, might, their, their networks might exist in more vulnerable state. So we do hypothesize, we think that um, successfully undergoing psychotherapy shifts the network dynamics configurations in a more resilient direction. And there is some indirect support for that. So for example, individuals who undergo, let's say cognitive behavioral therapy and psychodynamic psychotherapy, their risk of future depression is less compared to individuals who have just received medication treatment alone, which sort of like suggests that psychotherapy might be influencing 
the resilience of the networks in a way that medications might not be. So, uh, so we do see that sort of thing that th there might be a relationship between psychotherapy and network resilience. So now we um, enter into part three, where we begin to talk about COVID-19 and, and depression um, in context of that. When the pandemic started, uh, there was sort of like this general concern, this sort of like general appreciation that not only this poses sort of like, you know, risk to our physical safety and our physical health, but the pandemic is going to uh, influence our, our mental health as well. So we, we saw a lot of concern about this in the media. For example, this is the Guardian uh, saying COVID poses the greatest, has to, greatest threat to mental health in Second World War. Uh, BBC News saying psychiatrists fear tsunami of mental illness af after lockdown. Um, this is from the New York Times, sort of like relatively later in the in the pandemic, but still uh, across the world, COVID anxiety and and, and depression um, take hold. So uh, so there was sort of like this general idea that that you know a lot of people are experiencing depression and anxiety uh, in a way that is out of the ordinary and something something unusual is, is taking place and. Um, the, the reality of that, the data is somewhat mixed, but, but there's, it, it does lend support to, to the idea that there were significant increases in, in depression and anxiety symptoms. So this, for example, is, is a study that sort of like compared uh, prevalence of depression symptoms in um, sort of like in, in certain sub subjects, comparable subjects, before the before the pandemic, before COVID nineteen, and then during uh, COVID COVID nineteen, and and we can see that uh, the percentage of individuals who didn't have any depressive symptoms it, it fell quite significantly to sort of like you know it was kind of like around like seventy five percent or so, and it fell it fell down to sort of like you know forty seven forty eight percent, and correspondingly the proportions of uh, people who were experiencing various uh, degrees of depressive symptoms from mild, moderate to severe, uh, they, they went up. Sort of like, you know, so we see the uh, increase in people with mild depression, moderate depression, and severe, moderately severe and severe depression. And we can see that the corresponding increase in people with severe depression is, is quite a bit, is that this is sort of like a much greater jump than, for example, in people experiencing uh, mild symptoms. So this lends support to the idea, sort of like, you know, I, I think the overall, if we kind of average it out, it was like, it was almost like a three times increase in, in, in the prevalence of depressive symptoms compared to before and in, in the U.S. <clears throat> uh, and that studies that, that looked at sort of like worldwide, the global uh, sort of like thing, they, they found um, similar sorts of results as well. So this was a paper in, in Lancet, from, uh, from a sort of like a group of collaborators from 204 countries. And, uh, and what they found out was that um, uh, across the world during the pandemic, there were 53 million additional cases of depression, which was a 28% increase. And there were 76 million additional cases of anxiety, which was a 26% increase. Now you have to remember that, you know, they are making these judgments based on symptom thresholds uh, that have been set by the diagnostic manuals and in rating scales. So what they are doing is that they are measuring symptoms and they're looking at, you know, in what percentage of cases do these symptoms cross a certain threshold. And then we can see, we can sort of like, you know, based on early, our earlier discussion, that our thresholds are not very good. They're not sort of like very, uh, very sort of like, you know, optimized for, for, you know, for certain scientific matters. And they don't discriminate between, let's say, ordinary stressful situations versus disorders very well. So that's what should be kept in mind when we talk about this increase in disorders and increase in the, in the level of symptoms is that this is basically symptoms in a stressful situation without necessarily a lot of other meaningful uh, discrimination. Um, and then in the study, they also sort of like found um, an association between increase in depression and anxiety with COVID-19 infection rate. So countries and geographical reason, uh, regions where there was higher prevalence of, of COVID-19 infections and to COVID-19 deaths, et cetera, had sort of like worsening depression, anxiety, and geographical region and countries where there was more restrictive lockdowns, there, there were also um, more depression and anxiety. <clears throat> um, this is data from the, from the CDC, from USA. Uh, this was uh, released in, in October uh, 2021, uh, last year. Um, 
And, and this kind of follows the, the severity of anxiety and depression from August 2019, so, so a few months into the pandemic, um, till about May, 20, May 26, 2021, so last year. So it's kind of like a longitudinal study, almost like uh, two thirds of a year, um, uh, you know, during the first and the second year of the pandemic. And, and what we see is that, so, so you know, we're, we're at this beginning point, uh, the symptoms were already elevated above baseline. So we saw that, you know, uh, COVID-19 le- pandemic led to an increase in depression and anxiety symptoms. And what we see over time is that those elevated symptoms remain elevated. You know, they, they kind of worsen in the winter. So we, we see this worsening of depression and anxiety symptoms happening. People were becoming more depressed, more anxious over the course of winter, but, and there was sort of like, you know, um, kind of decrease back to like August levels and, and somewhat going down, but we, we are still continuing to see these elevated rates uh, across the entire time period. And, and naturally, because, you know, the, the pen, pandemic obviously didn't resolve, it's still going on. So uh, as the pandemic continued, we see this continuation of anxiety and depression sort of like, you know, still rem- remaining at, at high levels. Um, this is another um, sort of like, uh, sort of like information figure from the CDC and uh, reflecting the data in a different sort of way. So uh, uh, sort of like percentage of people who are reporting symptoms of anxiety, depressive disorder, and also broken down. And we see that sort of like over time from August onward, the the percentage of individual who are symptomatic is kind of either stable or going up. So we, we are not seeing the situation where the overall prevalence of these symptoms is going down. It's kind of like tends to be creeping up. And again, sort of like, you know, because the pandemic is a very stressful situation, posing a lot of problems for, pe- for people. Um, this is uh, also from the CDC uh, information regarding people who either took prescription medication, say, you know, for their depression or anxiety or received counseling or psychotherapy. And we can see that this is like, sort of like about like 23%, you know, coming sort of like slowly increasing to about 25% is that almost a quarter of the population was either receiving some form, form of medication or some form of psychotherapy to, to address their um, depression or anxiety symptoms. And then there, were an, uh, there was an additional 10% who felt that they needed some form of treatment, but weren't actively receiving that. Um, so, so definitely a, a huge kind of like, you know, portion of the population was struggling with that. But um, that's at the overall level. This kind of like hides like, you know, sir, like trends in, in between. And in particular, it also hides that the certain groups were much more affected than others. So women, for example, were affected much more than, than, than men. So like almost like three to four times more. And that's also understandable because uh, women bore the brunt of many of the sort of like, you know, the consequences of the lockdown, things like caring for, for children and uh, sort of like other things. Then individuals with previous mental health difficulties who already had prior diagnosis of depression, anxiety, and other psychiatric disorders, um, they were the ones, offered the ones who had higher risk of experiencing worse depression and anxiety during the pandemic. Um, individuals with low income living in poverty, um, sort of like, you know, sort of like indicating the role of the sort of like, you know, social determinants. Teenagers and young, young adults were affected more than older adults. Uh, parents of small children, um, Individuals who were living alone, who were isolated and lonely, those who lost loved one, loved ones, and again a huge sort of like you know proportion of the population did. <clears throat> individuals who were caregivers, sort of like you know for uh, for medically ill individuals, individuals with dementia, etc., and frontline healthcare workers. So uh, these were the groups that uh, that experienced the greatest increases in in uh, in, in depression and anxiety symptoms. And if we look at kind of like you know trends sort of like, you know, within the population, this was a study from the UK and they were, they followed people uh, in the early months of the pandemic. So this, the beginning point is March, 2020. So this is like when just at the start of the pandemic, pandemic has already started and they follow them up to, up till July of that year. And they see different tra- trajectories is that, so this one is what they call the resilient trajectory, about 56%, is that these people had low levels, like very low depression and anxiety, and they remained well throughout the, um, throughout the entire time. Then sort of like you had like one group, which was about 6%, who had sort of like really bad symptoms, really severe depression and anxiety symptoms, and they remained unwell throughout the, uh, the early months of the pandemic. Uh, we had one group that started off quite stressed but as the months went on, they started experiencing a lot of improvement. 
And then you had two more groups that kind of like were mild and moderate, but were experiencing um, significant deterioration in, in, in worsening of their symptoms as the pandemic was, was going on. So even though sort of like, you know, we have this overall sort of like trend of like, uh, you know, depression and anxiety symptoms worsening in the community, if we sort of like, you know, look at the trends, you know, there's no uniform increase, but different individuals are sort of like experiencing project different sorts of trajectories of, of depression and, and anxiety symptoms. And all right, so this was this was kind of like alluded by, by one of the questions earlier as well, is that um, the elephant in the room, like, you know, well, isn't this just normal? Uh, don't increase depression and anxiety reflect a natural psychological reaction to, to a perceived threat in a very stressful situation um, um, such, as, such as COVID-19. And, and the challenge for that is that sort of like it's, it's, it's a yes and no answer. And, and the problem is that we have very little scientific understanding of how to judge whether our response should be considered abnormal or dysfunctional. So sort of like these judgments of abnormality and sort of like this sort of like, you know, something being dysfunctional are not entirely fact-based judgments. They're sort of like very, very heavily value laden and they are intermixed with these practical concerns of distress, sort of like disability and, and, and the need for help. So this slide just kind of like, you know, shows some of the ways in which we try to make that demarcation. So sort of like the classic one that, that sort of like often comes up in medicine is this judgment of pathology. Like, you know, is there some identifiable bodily abnormality? And that doesn't apply very well to, to, to psychiatric disorders and things like depression and anxiety because we don't really find anything sort of like reliable or something that's sort of like identifiable in, in each case. Oftentimes, the brain seems to be working just as it should be working. So that doesn't help us much in, in, in the case of depression. Um, we can talk about statistical deviation, you know, is the phenomenon, is the severity of the, of the reaction atypical with respect to some reference class? And the challenge here becomes like, what's the reference class? Like, you know, what's the appropriate comparison for something like this? And, and if we look at the overall population level, you know, if we have a situation where 25 to 35% of people are experiencing these symptoms, then, you know, in what scenario are they normal, are they typical? But if they are typical, then th does that mean we just don't do anything about them? So it, it begins to sort of like that sort of thinking begins to break down as well. We can talk about evolutionary dysfunction, sort of like, you know, does it involve failure of mechanisms to perform their evolved functions? But we just don't know enough about the sort of like evolution of the brain and evolution of sort of like you know, psychological functions to make that sort of determination. So we end up falling on these folk psychological judgments, you know, is the reaction excessive? Is it, is it out of proportion? Is it manageable by our ordinary resources? You know, how distressing is it? How disabling it is? How negatively is it, is it affecting our survival? How severe are the symptoms? Like how complicated are they? You know, and time codes. Like is, is it transient, which helps in, uh, in the case of other stressors, but doesn't really help as much in the case of a pand pandemic, which is kind of ongoing. So the question like, why does this matter? So like, you know, why, why would we, we want to be so concerned about this question of abnormality and, and disorderedness? And one way in which this question matters is that distress that results from stressful social arrangements is best addressed by changing those arrangements. And if, if, if that sort of situation, we don't necessarily want to call a disorder because in that case, we would shift the emphasis to individual interventions. So for example, if an individual is distressed because they are homeless, then ideally we want to address the homelessness and provide them housing rather than give them a pill because that, that's not going to help. So the question does matter. Sort of like you know, We want some kind of a demarcation between distress from social arrangements and distress that is, that is a result of some kind of dysfunction. We just don't have very good sort of like scientific ways of, of doing so. Uh, this is a quote from Alan Horvitz from, from a 2007 article that kind of like highlights this, the, this sort of dilemma that we face. It's that defining conditions as individual pathologies leaves untouched social structures that often do not provide meaningful jobs, a decent living, or equitable social arrangements. For example, new institutional structures that provide effective health with childcare could do far more to promote mental health than prescribing a pill to an overwhelmed parent. Symptom-based definitions of mental illness produce artificially large prevalence rates and a consequent policy emphasis on unmet need for mental health uh, services. 
So we, we, we sort of like, we should have let sort of like symptom based threshold distract us too much and into shifting our emphasis from structural and policy measures towards just sort of like individual interventions such as uh, medications and, and psychotherapy. Um, and this is sort of like, you know, uh, in, in the US, the, the mental health care system was already quite sort of like, you know, understaffed. There was a huge shortage of mental health professionals. And when the pandemic started with this increase um, in, in individuals with, you know, experiencing difficulties and symptoms, uh, the system was just overwhelmed. And this was a New York Times story documenting how therapists across the US were simply completely booked, overwhelmed, seeing very sort of like difficult cases and uh, patients struggling to find to find help in an, an accessible manner. Now, sort of like, a, so we, we sort of like see this problem. I've set up the problem, you know, of distinguishing between a str- sort of like distress in the context of a dist- uh, distressing situation versus um, a sort of like something that might be dysfunctional disorder. And here, I think I want to sort of like, you know, refer back to this idea of resilient networks and vulnerable networks, because at least it offers us some clues regarding how to distinguish that. So for example, you know, in the case of individuals who have elevated symptoms, but otherwise have resilient networks, you know, these are the people we want to address by providing them social support. We want to sort of like, you know, address their healthcare problems. We want to address their uh, sort of like housing problems, you know, childcare problems. Because if we do that, if we do that well with, with policy measures, their, their mental health would improve and get better. Versus this is a situation where even if sort of like, you know, we provide these social resources that might prevent the development, but once the mental disorder has, but once the network has become self-sustaining, you are going to need some kind of individual intervention, such as um, psychotherapy or, or treatment. So this leads sort of like to us to sort of recognize that because our current thresholds of symptoms start distinguished be- between these sorts of situations, there's an essential role for, for uh, social interventions for policy, is that protect, protecting people from economic consequences of the pandemic, providing practical support to parents of young children, caregivers, um, policy measures that protect, protect against loss of, of life. And these are all things that would improve mental health at the societal level. And then at the same time, we need to increase treatment resources for the most vulnerable who are not going to respond to just these social interventions um, alone. To, to kind of like summarize uh, this uh, uh, sort of like discussion in the part three. So I think studies reliably show that there has been a prominent increase in depression and anxiety symptoms during the COVID-19 pandemic but different groups have been affected in different ways and their trajectories have been different. Um, There's no clear scientific answer, unfortunately, regarding how to judge whether a response to a stressor such as the pandemic should be considered abnormal or disordered. So we rely on a variety of indirect judgments, a variety of folk judgments regarding how impairing it is, how disabling it is, how bad it is, how severe it is. And because we are not able to differentiate that very well, social political interventions are essential for addressing mental health in the context of, of an ongoing a pandemic and not seeing this as a problem that just requires individual interventions. The Origin Science Scholars Lectures are presented by Case Western Reserve University's Institute for the Science of Origins with the assistance of the Siegel Lifelong Learning Program, the College of Arts and Sciences, and Media Vision. For more information on the Origin Science Scholars Program, including a full video archive, please visit the Institute's website at origins.case.edu.